So the paper is about higher order effects in portfolio choice uh, model. Um, it's, it's joint work with uh, David from Lancaster and, and, and Trino Niget from, from Westminster. Um, okay, so wha what's the motivation? The motivation uh, is, is, is basically, um, you know, higher order risk preferences uh, need to be considered uh, in order to examine economic decisions and the risk and uncertainty. Uh, now it's very clear that um, we should have a richer or um, let's say wider description of the uh, risk profile of the agents uh, before analyzing their uh, decisions and the risk and uh, uncertainty. Now, the, uh, the study of, of risk attitudes beyond uh, risk aversion uh, has been significantly developed over the last uh, 10 years. And, and then um, uh, concepts and, um, that refer to risk preferences of, of higher order such as prudence, temperance, edginess, higher order risk uh, apportionment has, has become more and more important in, in the literature about uh, decision making. And, I, and I'm just here pointing out uh, some of them on, on, on life cycle investments, on monetary policy, on insurance demand, bidding in auctions, bargaining, prevention. So it's, it's, it's a long list. So uh, obviously in, in finance, uh, indeed, we can't really uh, ignore, ignore that or in financial um, economics. So, so that's the motivation of, of the work. Um, now, th there's been some, some recent work in terms of uh, evaluating uh, portfolios in portfolios performance evaluation. There is a recent paper uh, in, in the JBF that uh, present a um, theoretically sound portfolio performance uh, measure that, take, that takes into account higher order risk preferences. Um, the reason I'm highlighting this is that uh, many of the uh, measures, uh, many of the measures uh, for portfolio performance are particularly not well uh, theoretically motivated, or they don't have a strong economic foundation. Um, you know, there are a lot of what we call arbitrary reward to risk ratios. There is a big family, for instance, of, of sharp ratios that don't have maybe uh, strong um, economic uh, foundations, for instance, the ones based on, on, on value at risk. Um, that are very widely uh, used. This, this paper uh, is, is an exception, and, and they basically provide a link between those measures of performance and um, you know, the utility that the agents get uh, uh, you know, for the different scores. And that justifies the use of generalized sharp ratios, or as the one that uh, they develop in this paper, the uh, adjusted for skewness sharp ratio. <clears throat> now, uh, let me introduce uh, the two main concepts I'm going to discuss to the, to, today about higher order uh, preferences. The first one is, is prudence, and, and it's a bit, it touches a bit, a bit on what Stephen discussed uh, earlier on uh, today. Now, uh, within the spectral utility uh, theory, which is the framework I'm, I'm going to uh, be constrained uh, in, in, in this talk, um, Kimball in 1990 uh, coined the term prudence, and that's basically uh, because the condition for an agent uh, to engage in precautionary uh, saving uh, in the consumption saving model, that's basically if the agent uh, you know, has uncertainty about his future income, and as a consequence of that, is saving today. Uh, the, the necessary condition for that and, and sufficient is that the marginal utility is, is convex. Okay. So to that characteristic, uh, you know, uh, Kimball coined it as, as uh, prudent. You know, the agent would be prudent if the third derivative of the utility function was positive. Now, um, we can also have a similar description of, of that risk preference 
in terms of preferences toward risks. And, and this is a bit what, what Stephen uh, also discussed earlier on today. And that's a preference. So prudence is equivalent to having a preference for disaggregating risks. Yeah? So if, if, if I ask you, you know, that uh, you know, I'm going to impose a, a mean zero risk uh, on you, on two different states of the world, one where you have uh, lower wealth, one uh, you know, where you have higher wealth, if you uh, choose to, uh, to bear the uh, zero mean risk uh, when you have in the state of the world where you have higher risk, uh, sorry, higher wealth, uh, you are a prudent, okay? And now that's been proved by Ehout and Anne Schlesinger in the AER paper. And again, they relate that to the signing of the derivative of the utility of the, of the utility function, such that the, the third derivative has to be positive and therefore having a decreasing utility premium. An equivalent concept is aversion to increases in downside risk from um, Menezes et al. in the year 1980, where a downside risk increase does not change, does not change the mean or the variance uh, uh, of, of a prospect, but it does decrease its skewness. Okay? And that's also related to the signing of the uh, uh, third derivative of the utility function. And that's a very important concept because when, when we talk about pure higher order risk preferences, obviously the, uh, the uh, lower, um, you know, the lower moments or, or, the, or the lower uh, risk preferences had to be kept constant. Okay? So obviously mean and variance have to be uh, kept constant. Then I change the third one you know, how does the agent behave under that scenario? And that's the effect of the pure uh, uh, third order risk preference. Okay? And, and I think that's very important. Um, and a bit I think where, you know, the, the, the literature in finance is somehow not getting a complete grip of the relationship between a statistical moments and, and, and econ uh, theory. Uh, the one related with the uh, fourth order effect, temperance, Again, coined by uh, Kimball in 1992, uh, within a spectral utility theory, it's basically, it's very intuitive. <coughs> if you have the advent of an uh, unavoidable risk, okay, leads an individual to, re to reduce exposure to another risk. Or put it differently, if I have to impose on you two zero mean risks yeah, in two different states of the nature, where would you choose to uh, have them? If you choose to have them in separate state of the nature rather than having one with both risks and one with no risk, yeah? if you choose to disaggregate the risk in two different states of, of the nature, then the agent is uh, temperate. Okay? And the condition for that is that the fourth derivative has to be uh, negative. <coughs> uh, similarly, uh, Erhout and Schlesinger related that to uh, preferences toward risk uh, in, in, in a lottery, in a lottery uh, setup, and that's basically, that's basically it, yeah? <coughs> it's, it's the preference for disaggregating uh, the, the risk, and they uh, refer that also in terms of the signing of the derivative, uh, such that the four derivative has to be negative. An equivalent concept is the aversion to outer risk, where an increase in outer risk increases the kurtosis of the prospect, but leaves the first three moments constant. And that's, that's the crucial characteristic. In order to talk about pure higher order risk attitudes or preferences, you have to control for the other ones. If all of them you know, are, are moving around, you can't really pin down the higher order uh, risk preference. <coughs> Now, empirical results, um, elicitation of these higher order risk preferences has been very recently done uh, basically through experimental work where you can obviously control, you know, for the characteristics of, of, of the lotteries or the returns, uh, such as when agents make decisions about different distributions or choices of lotteries, uh, you can actually uh, relate them exactly to higher order uh, preferences. And indeed, the results point to significant evidence of these behavioral traits. Okay? Most of the agents uh, would be prudent, uh, though not all of them. 
and, and that's an issue around six, two thirds of, of, of the subjects. And uh, you know, temperance is a bit less clear, it's more like a 50-50 uh, evidence. So there is a still a lot of uh, work in progress. Um, um, I haven't been able to find uh, in, in the finance literature a lot of um, uh, work where you can actually relate, you know, uh, a specific um, um, uh, evidence of pure higher order uh, risk preferences. <coughs> But indeed, they shouldn't be ignored because we know that a large proportion of the population, as the theory predicts, should be prudent and, and temperate. Um, I will leave the high, higher than four orders um, or the moments out. Now, what's the contribution of this paper? It's, it's very simple. We keep a very simple um, framework, eh, the portfolio choice model within a spectator utility uh, theory and basically we want to obtain the optimal level and the uh, proportion even though I will just show the uh, equations for the proportion obviously we have the, the, the levels as well that an agent would invest in the risky asset hmm? uh, <coughs> and to write that as a function of both investors higher order risk preferences and the statistical moments. And also, I want to have an intuition of how important these effects are. So in theory, obviously, we can derive them, but I wanted to have an intuition of how important they are maybe in the data. If I had the data, you know, how much really uh, they do matter. Uh, <coughs> okay, so we'll try to get an intuition on, on this. Th this is a still obviously work in progress. Um, so I'm very, I'm very happy to, to welcome any comments. Now, the, as I said, the setup uh, you know, is a standard portfolio choice uh, model, which we are all very familiar with. So we basically have to ma ma we maximize expected utility of, of the agent that can invest in a risky asset uh, with, uh, with obviously unknown uh, uh, returns that follow a distribution or in a riskless asset. And the proportion that the agent invests in the risky asset is alpha. <coughs> okay. So basically it has to maximize the spectre utility with respect to alpha. And I'm going to skip all the uh, maths and just going uh, um, straight to the, uh, to the last expression. Now we very well, we are all uh, very much aware of the standard uh, optimal condition for the proportion of wealth invested in the risky asset and that is basically uh, mean of the variance times one over the relative risk aversion. Okay? So this is the uh, standard uh, result in a mean variance uh, framework. In this case, as you can see obviously, the optimal solution only settles through the mean variance uh, trade-off mm? and we use that uh, very often. And, uh, and you can obviously obtain the marginal effects of the statistical moments on the proportion of wealth invested in the risky asset. Eh? So the marginal effect of uh, uh, spectral return, the marginal effect of variance, so obviously you know, the marginal effect of spectral return is, is, is uh, inversely related to the variance of the returns and, and, and the marginal effect of the variance is, is negative, obviously, okay? And it has this form. Obviously, Higher statistical moments don't matter in this framework, in the mean, mean variance framework. They don't matter, okay? For, for the optimal allocation of, of the portfolio. So what we do is, um, obviously the standard solution disregard the information of higher order moments and higher order risk preferences. So what we do is that we take a second order Taylor approximation, eh, the, the, previous, the previous result uh, uh, is based on a first order Taylor uh, approximation. We take a second order Taylor approximation <coughs> in order to obtain the new expression for uh, the optimal alpha proportion invested in the risky asset. I keep here uh, in, in, in black uh, in the, uh, the previous solution, uh, that's under the, the first order the, um, uh, approximation. And now we can see here in red the new term that comes up uh, uh, from a higher order um, approximation. Now as you can see here, now the, um, 
third central moment, uh, thus matter, as well as the uh, coefficient on relative prudence. So we have now the effect of both the higher order statistical moments of the distribution and higher order risk preferences. So now they do matter in the optimal allocation uh, invested in the risky, in the risky asset. Okay. <coughs> and indeed, uh, we could have obviously possible wealth effect depending on, on, on the form that we use. <coughs> Sorry. Now, uh, we can now compute the marginal effects of, of that optimal uh, proportion of wealth with respect to the first, second uh, moment. And as you can see, there are again new terms, obviously, in these marginal effects. So now, uh, skewness and relative prudence is going to matter as well for the marginal effect of the first two moments. And indeed, uh, the third central moment doesn't have a zero, a zero effect um, on, on the optimal uh, allocation. From uh, four onwards, it's, it's obviously uh, negative. Now, uh, we can expand this even further, and we can take a third order Taylor approximation, and then we will have the first term, we will have the new term under the second order, and now we are going to have a new term where basically we are going to have uh, this ZR is going to depend on the distributional moments up to four and on the higher order risk preferences up to four, eh, including relative prudence. Um, here you have the, the expression, which looks a bit nasty, um, but anyway, so all these blue terms are new and, and as you can see, uh, relative uh, temperance is there and kurtosis, uh, let's say it's not kurtosis, but you know the, the fourth central moment uh, is, is there as well. Okay? So with those solutions, we do not disregard the information of higher order uh, statistical moments and risk preferences. And indeed, all the um, marginal effects will be affected by, by these new terms. And indeed, uh, you know, the fourth central moment will also have an effect on the optimal allocation of, of wealth. <coughs> now, um, I'm going to skip the example about the log utility, where uh, the coefficients of, of relative risk aversion, prudence, and temperance are one, two, and three. This is just basically, you know, um, to see. In, a, in an easier way, the effect of the uh, statistical moments, but I'm just going to uh, skip that. Now, in the last five minutes, I'm going to uh, talk about how important these, these effects are. Uh, obviously, you could have a utility function and you could compute the uh, coefficient of relative uh, prudence and relative temperance, but, um, you know, I wanted to have an intuition of maybe how important this effect might be for the data that we typically use. Okay? So we, we take the uh, paper by uh, Bruno Meyer and Nagel in the AR in, in 2008 in, in their analysis of, of households portfolio allocation in, in the US. Um, and then we see that, uh, that the, the alpha, the average alpha for the uh, US households is around 56. Uh, 56%. So what we did is that uh, we took the uh, Standard & Poor's as an approximation for the uh, return on the uh, risky on the risky asset um, and 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 the uh, and the real returns on the three month uh, treasury bill as the uh, riskless um, asset from 1926 to 2010 and and then if if for instance you use um, uh, relative risk aversion coefficient of three, relative prudence of four, and, and temperance of five. What will happen? Okay, if you just use the, uh, the first uh, alpha, okay, uh, the one only under the first order Taylor approximation, you will get a value of 66%. If you plug in the moments of, of this, okay, into, into the uh, uh, second expression for the alpha, it would go down to 0.62. <coughs> and that's basically uh, because the standard and poor has some negative skewness 
and, and, and high uh, neg negative, some negative skewness all over the period. Thanks. And then if you use the, uh, the last you know, expression for alpha, the one that takes into account moments up to four, then it would go down to 0.59. Okay? So obviously this, this is not uh, proven anything, but it's just to give a bit of a flavor of how important uh, the, you know, the other moments can be in, in, a very standard, in a very standard setup. Uh, actually what we also did is, is to do it in, an, in, in a recursive way. So we start from 1960 and we compute all the alpha one, which is the blue line, alpha two, which is the red line, and alpha three, which is the green line. And we see how actually it moves over time depending on the uh, moments of, of the distribution. <coughs> so basically the distance, the distance between the blue and the green is the effect of the higher order uh, moments. Don't get any way fooled by the scale because this starts at 0.48, okay, and that was 2.70. But still, sometimes it's like you know 10, 15, maybe up to 20 percentage points uh, of what we would predict that would be the optimal behavior of the households if we were to disregard the uh, higher order risk preferences and uh, moments. <coughs> um, and then, for instance, some, uh, uh, to give another flavor, for instance, a calibration uh, where, as you can see here, if I keep the uh, expected value and the variance constant and the kurtosis, yeah, at those three values, okay, and then you change the skewness, let's say, imagine you have a skewness that is a positive skewness of 0.28, yeah, um, you know, relative to a negative skewness of minus 0.78. If you just use the standard condition, the optimal alpha would be 0.8, and that's it. There wouldn't be any difference between those two periods. Okay. If you use alpha alpha um, uh, three, actually, uh, it, it actually goes down quite a bit. Okay, this is a bit of an extreme case because there is a big difference in the skewness. And then another calibration with re regarding the uh, kurtosis, okay, where the first three moments are the same and you change the kurtosis from three to six, you can see again how the effect of the kurtosis is around 16, uh, 17 percentage points. So this is just to get a flavor of how important maybe uh, this effect um, uh, can be with numbers more or less calibrated from, from the ones that, that we observe. Okay, thank you. <laughs>